Hi, and welcome to the third module on clinical gait analysis. Uh, I'm Ryan Remick. I'm an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Kennedy Krieger Institute. This third module will discuss specifically the energetics involved with walking, and also provide some miscellaneous information about uh, clinical gait analysis in both stroke and other pathological populations. So gait energetics, what do we mean by gait energetics? In energetic studies, we simply quantify the amount of energy that we use to move. This can be measured in multiple ways. First, we can measure the mechanical energy that someone is producing to move. This is where we often model the body as something very simple, like a spring with a point mass on top. And by using this simplification, we can make assumptions that allow us to calculate the potential and kinetic energy of the center of mass on individual body segments. We can also measure metabolic energy. In these types of studies, we measure the indirect uh, measure, it's an indirect measure of energetics because we use calorimetry using expired gas analysis. So what this means is the participants actually wear a breathing tube that they breathe into and we track the gases that they both inhale and exhale using our metabolic system to get a feel for their respiratory rate and the concentration of those gases that we can then use to measure energy expenditure. So why are energetics important? Well, most obviously in our patient populations, high energy expenditure often leads to negative effects like fatigue and inactivity. But more broadly, we think that energy optimization is the key objective of human gait. So for example, on this uh, figure that you see at the bottom of the slide, this is a study that is over 60 years old now where they measured energy expenditure across a variety of different speeds. And if you normalize the energy expenditure to the distance that someone traveled, or so we call this cost of transport, you can think of this very similar as to, for example, uh, the miles per gallon or the kilometers per liter that a, a car may use in terms of gas mileage. Uh, the human body uses energy in an efficient way and we tend to walk at speeds that minimize this energy expenditure. So the, the amount of energy that we expend to walk shapes how we prefer to move throughout our environment. So how do we do this? How do we quantify the energy cost of walking via expired gas analysis? Well, we measure volumes of oxygen and carbon dioxide during breathing as participant walks or the patient walks on a treadmill or a long circuit. It's necessary to perform these analysis on a treadmill or, or a track or a long circuit that someone can walk on because we need at least three minutes of, of, simul of continuous calculation of this energy expenditure to ensure that the person is walking in steady state. Um, your breathing tends to increase linearly over the first three minutes of, so of your walking pattern. And so we need to start making these measurements once that is stabilized. Uh, do we then calculate the metabolic rate, which is the simply the volume of, of oxygen uh, normalized to your body mass and multiplied by a, a minute. Then we, as I mentioned, we calculate the cost of transport as the, the volume of this oxygen normalized to body mass and then also the distance that you traveled. And so then we can also calculate metabolic power, which is just simply a conversion of the volume of CO2 or of oxygen and, and carbon dioxide to approximate mechanical power. And that's often done using this simple equation that you see here that has been used for over 30 years. So revisiting our, our patient that we've been working with over the previous uh, two modules. Again, the patient is shown here walking. We've discussed this a few times, but the left leg walks uh, less well than the right leg. They show changes in their kinematics. They show changes in their kinetics, and they show changes in their electromyography or their EMG patterns. And so what this leads to is if we measure different, if we measure the energy costs associated with different walking speeds in this patient, we can see that the patient is, is capable of walking slower or faster than their comfortable walking pace. But when they're asked to do these things, we find that they actually spend more energy to walk faster or more energy to walk slower and they do at their comfortable speed. So again, there's this idea at play that energy optimization or the desire to minimize the amount of energy that we expend while walking may drive this person to select this specific comfortable walking pattern rather than walking at their full capacity. Importantly here, the dashed lines also indicate measures of energy expenditure that you might expect from a healthy individual. And we can see in all cases, this patient exhibits higher energy cost and would be observed in a healthy participant. So walking for this person is much more effortful, much more fatiguing than we might expect for a healthy participant.
So what can we do with this data? Can we use energetics and electromyography to understand the energy cost of individual muscles? We've done some of this work in the lab as well, where we use three-dimensional simulation software, musculoskeletal simulation software called OpenSim. Uh, this is freely available online, and you can download these models of, of the legs or even the whole human body with all of the muscles and bones attached to generate simulations and what might happen to someone's walking were different muscles to become impaired. So again, this generates simulated gait patterns based on both EMG or muscle activity and kinematics inputs. And we can manipulate these inputs to observe again how changing many aspects of different walking might influence the walk patient's walking pattern. And we can measure these outputs in terms of the energy cost of, of these impairments, the kinetic changes that are caused by these impairments, or even the kinetics that are changed by, for example, inactivation of different muscles in the body. So now that we've looked at the kinematics, the kinetics, the EMG, and the energetics in this patient, how should we rehabilitate them? Well, what we might suggest is that we could use something to, to enhance the, the activation of that ankle musculature, so something like functional electrical stimulation to improve their plantar flex or push off. So this could, in theory, help to, to activate their ankle muscles and generate a stronger push in that impaired leg. We may also recommend hamstring ex strengthening exercises uh, in order to improve their knee flexion during gait, and also try to challenge them to increase their daily walking activity such that walking doesn't become so fatiguing over time. At the conclusion of this module, I'm going to talk about some different approaches to clinical gait analysis beyond those that we've talked about so far, uh, especially because there's often a need to perform these types of analyses in settings where there's less accessibility to research gait equipment. So if you were performing these analyses in a smaller clinic or a smaller facility that doesn't have a budget for things like uh, a motion capture analysis lab or force plates embedded in the treadmill, it's important to have more general measures that are sim simple, quick, informative, and um, can be directly applied to the patient. So what can typically be measured in the clinic without access to all of this more expensive equipment? Some common things are spatiotemporal measures. These are things like step length, walking speed, step time that can be measured very uh, simply. There are also things like functional assessments. For example, the amount of time it takes someone to stand up out of a chair, walk, turn back around and sit back down in the chair, or activity counts that you can measure from wearables like a Fitbit device or an Apple Watch. There are also some more occasional things that are not collected quite so frequently, but can still be done uh, in many settings. These include Pressure distribution, if you have uh, insoles that I'll show you in a few slides that can fit into a patient's shoes. Center of pressure during standing ballots, if you have a relatively cheap force plate. And expired ga gas analysis, if you have access to, for example, an exercise physiology clinic or a cardiology clinic that might have a metabolic heart. So as I mentioned, straight uh, spatial temporal gait parameters are relatively straightforward walking parameters that you can collect using a variety of different methods. The three most common that we probably study in our lab are gait speed, step length, which is simply the distance between the feet at heel strike of two subsequent steps, and step time, which is again, just the times of those step lengths. Other metrics that you might be interested in, in measuring are stride length, which is the distance the foot travels from one heel strike to the next heel strike of the same foot. So instead of looking at how far this foot stepped ahead of the other foot, we look at how far uh, the same foot is two steps ahead of the previous step. And then again, stride time is the same, uh, is, is the time interval calculated over the same uh, movement pattern for that one foot. Here are some other quick definitions of spatial temporal gait pattern parameters that you might want to calculate. Uh, gait speed is simply stride length over stride time. Cadence is the number of steps per minute taken. Stance time is the time when the foot is in contact with the ground, while swing time is the time when the foot is not in contact with the ground. Single support time is the time when only one foot is in contact with the ground, and finally double support time is the amount of time when both feet are standing on the ground simultaneously. We mentioned this a little bit in the, in the early, earlier module, but here are different phases of gait. Again, we can start large from a whole gait cycle. This can be broken down into two smaller phases, a stance phase and a swing phase. And even beyond these phases, we can begin to break down further into things like single support, limb advancement, weight acceptance, and then even further into mid-stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, et cetera. So we can get very detailed about how we analyze walking or we can stay um, relatively broad in terms of how we can classify and analyze someone's gait. So how do we do this? What are some other tools that we might be able to use outside of these uh, more expensive devices that we've talked about previously? 
One common device is a gait mat. So this is a pressure sensing mat that tracks a, a patient's footfalls as they walk across the mat. From these footfalls, we can generate spatiotemporal information that include things like walking speed or step length. You can also use activity monitors. As I mentioned a few slides ago, these, things are, these are things like Fitbit or an Apple Watch that can be used to, to track the number of steps a person takes in a day. And we can also use foot switches. These are, are simple devices that fit into a person's shoe and they can detect how much pressure the person is exerting on these uh, pressurized pads that are included inside of the foot switch. Finally, these are pressure insoles. Uh, these differ from a foot switch because they actually localize those pressures. So you can get this nice, as you can see a little bit here on this um, small device, you can get a pressure map of, of where those pressures are being applied uh, across the sole of the foot. Uh, this is often done for conditions like diabetes where there's a need to understand how much pressure a patient is exerting in different areas of their foot when they're walking. So what are some common deficits, eight deficits in clinical populations? In persons post-stroke, there are several things that we typically look for, but here are some of the most common. Persons post-stroke often exhibit slow walking speeds. They exhibit asymmetry in their walking, or as we were talking about on the previous few modules, a limping-like walking pattern. They often showed impaired paretic limb propulsion, like we saw in the patient that we had used an example, where they're less able to push forward uh, with their more impaired leg. They exhibit weakness or impaired paretic support, so they have a much more difficult time standing on that impaired leg. They may show spasticity or co-contraction, where there's unusual muscle activity where both agonist and antagonist muscles are acting simultaneously. They show high cost of transport or excessive energy expenditure during walking, and this can also be associated with what we see here last, which is decreased activity and decreased physical fitness. If we're assessing a patient with Parkinson's disease, we might expect different deficits. So while the slowed gait speed is common, they exhibit many things that are not quite so common to what we see in stroke. For example, stooped posture, shuffling gait, a highly variable gait with high stride to stride variability, significant postural instability, which leads to an increased risk of falling. And they may have episodic gait deficits or things that only happen once in a while, but are not continuous throughout the walking pattern. So things like freezing or difficulty in initiating gait. And finally, they also often have decreased activity and decreased physical fitness. If we're studying amputees, uh, the, the gait deficits that we observe are often highly dependent on the prosthesis that the amputee uses. This can cause, depending on the type of prosthesis, it can cause increased stress on the joints, Instability, circumduction, which is where the leg kind of swings around the outside of the body rather than moving mostly in the sagittal plane or mostly in the forward, uh, anterior, posterior direction. And because of this, we can also see vaulting or hip hiking where the healthy leg uh, moves more vertically than might be expected to help uh, clear the ground for that, that prosthetic leg to swing through. In older adults with more general mobility disability, we again often observe slowed walking speeds and increased stride to stride variability. Many of our older adults that have mobility disability also have difficulty performing um, dual task activities. So something like walking and talking at the same time. They may also have instability and frailty and over-reliance on assisted devices, which again can lead to this common theme of decreased physical activity and decreased physical fitness. So thank you for paying attention to the, uh, the three modules that we've gone over with today. I hope that you've learned a little bit more about how to perform clinical gait analyses. And I know there'll be a live session coming up, so I'd be happy to answer any questions at that time.